Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Society of Geneva. We seek to meet you wherever you are on your journey and invite you to be part of this congregation in which we draw wisdom from all the world's religions balanced with the insights of modern science. We seek to build a diverse, beloved community within our virtual walls and hope to inspire and accompany one another as we act for peace and justice in our larger world. Around this time last year, I was a candidate here at UUSG. I remember plowing through several dozen interviews with various groups, a process that the search team cheerfully referred to as the grilling. And I remember being asked about my thoughts on social justice. I'm pretty sure I said something like, generally, I'm for it, which seems like a wise thing to say. In what may have been a synapse misfire, however, I remember also talking about Maslow's hierarchy of social justice. <clears throat> There's no such thing, of course. I was riffing on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You probably remember that the hierarchy is a model that explores the relationship between the things we human beings seem to need in order to live the lives we want to live. We can arrange these needs <clears throat> as if they were a pyramid with physical needs down on the bottom. And then <clears throat> with needs like, excuse me, uh, needs like air, <clears throat> shelter, water, and food. Maslow put uh, psychological needs like safety, love, and belonging in the middle of the pyramid. And at the top, uh, we find things like personal fulfillment, enlightenment, and human flourishing. Intuitively, this all makes sense. Some things are rather fundamental, and without those fundamentals, our other needs may never be able to be met. So in my uh, ramblings on a theme of Maslow, I stack ranked social justice in exactly that kind of way. I said that today we're facing a series, a cascading series of issues. First and foremost, the pandemic, an immediate and pervasive threat to life and life as we know it. Past the pandemic was identity stuff. And we can see this all today in the ongoing trial in the death of George Floyd and, the, and in the police shootings of Adam Toledo and Dante Wright, people of color obviously suffering from the effects of systemic racism. Fortunately, this is not the only challenge of this kind that we're facing today. We're only a few years past actually debating whether love between gay and lesbian people was the same as love between straight people. We're still having the so-called debate <clears throat> about whether trans people can use the bathroom. We are only a few years since the Me Too movement and the previous presidential administration managed to book itself, bookend itself rather neatly on the one end with huge surges in hate crimes against Muslims and on the other with similar attacks on people of Asian descent. Now, taking a step down the pyramid to mid-level threats, I probably said that we are seeing the world rocked by assault of, of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, conspiracy theories, and lies, all as a backdrop to a rise in global authoritarianism, nationalism, and the emergence of hate groups. And underneath all of that is the base of the pyramid, global climate change the fundamental threat where we talk about air, shelter, water, food, all as prerequisites for any other conversation about social justice. <clears throat> In the years since, my attitude really hasn't changed. I still don't like talking about climate change. There was an article in the Washington Post yesterday that noted how hard it is to read anything about the climate and not come away shocked. Admittedly, this is the point of much of that writing. As climate activist Greta Thunberg said, quote, I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to act as if the house was on fire because it is. And I hear her words when I read about George Floyd's murder. I hear her words when I read about QAnon. I hear her words when I read about President Biden's infrastructure investment plan. Don't you understand? I hear myself saying, the house is on fire. 
So in honor of Earth Day, I want to talk about this fear I have, that many of us have, about the world ending. Because we have to remember, the point isn't that nothing can be done. Actually, the opposite is true. The point is, we're going to need to get a move on. And while the project ahead of us is daunting, we're past the point where the future will look like the past. This is a good time to do our thing. So with the mics still muted, I'm going to remove the Zoom spotlight for a moment. What I want you to do is go to your screen and touch that button in the upper corner, upper right-hand corner of the screen, the one that says view. And I want you to pull down until it says gallery, click that. Now, if you haven't activated your camera now, is an awesome time to do so. Otherwise, we're just staring at a blank spot where your name is. You'll know everything's working right because you should have boxes everywhere. <clears throat> now, looking at all of those faces, your community, and in the spirit of our friend, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss, the third of Trinity Church here in Chicago, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, the future will not look like the past. Amen. Resume the center stage here. My apologies for the arrogance of centering myself in such a way, but it's just easier to see and hear me if you can see and hear me. My text for this morning is Elizabeth Colbert's new book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. She's best known for her other book, The Sixth Extinction, which explores something she calls the Anthropocene Age, like the Cambrian or Jurassic Ages. In the Anthropocene, the age of humankind, we see human beings as the primary force behind change, evolution, and unfortunately, mass extinctions. Colbert won a Pulitzer for this exploration. It's a good book, and I recommend it to you. In her new work, she turns her eye toward a peculiar feature of the Anthropocene, humanity's attempts to change Mother Nature. To be fair, our track record is spotty. On the one hand, we have canals, dams, bridges, the whole of agriculture, antibiotics, and vaccines. To say we've done well is the understatement of understatements. On the other hand, though, well, let's just say we've had a lot of good intentions. Good intentions that fell victim to the law of unintended consequences. Unintended consequences are all over. Colbert uh, references Asian carp and cane toads, for example, but there are many others like snakeheads, rabbits, Nile perch, kudzu, mongoose, dandelions, and zebra mussels. It's a long list of good ideas that went just a bit sideways. You can feel free to Google those. One instructive case she mentions, though, is the levees along the Mississippi River. An Army Corps of Engineering project, these levees protect the lives and property of millions of people. They also prevent the seasonal overflows where the river, if left alone, would normally have dumped billions of tons of sediment, rock, and dirt all over uh, southern Louisiana. Controlling the river means eliminating those regular deposits. And the result is that Louisiana is disappearing. The levees are funneling what would naturally replace erosion right out into the Gulf and off the continental shelf. Oof. And while we can debate whether or not 30, 50, or even 70 foot high levees are a brilliant engineering fix, or merely yet another example of human hubris in the face of irresistible mother nature, the point is this. Today, there's just not a lot of choice. The levees are a technical fix. Relocating the people is a political one and one we're avoiding. However, with the decisions that have already been made, all the Corps can do right now is keep the city modestly dry while the politicians debate. And as they talk, the city slowly sinks. If we're being honest, the Corps won them more time to talk 
at best. I want to lean into this because it turns out that this example is really helpful in trying to understand something called overshoot. And given where we're going today, uh, we need to understand this concept. So backing up, let me say for the sake of the argument that I'm just going to assume the scientific consensus is right, that CO2 goes into the atmosphere and once there, it acts like a blanket, a blanket that warms up everything underneath it. And the warmer the planet gets, the more dangerous things get. The question, at least I, what I had, right, was how much warming is too much? Colbert says, quote, no one can say exactly how hot the world can get before out and out disaster becomes inevitable. Officially, the threshold of catastrophe is a global, uh, average global temperature rise of two degrees Celsius. Virtually every nation signed on to that number in 2010 in Cancun. She uh, continues, quote, meeting in Paris in 2015, world leaders had second thoughts. The two degree threshold they decided was too high. The signatories of the Paris Agreement committed themselves to holding the increase in global average temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius and pursuing efforts to limit, limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degree C. So that's the goal, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Colbert notes though, that to stay under two degrees Celsius, global emissions would have to fall to nearly zero within the next several decades. To stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius, emissions would have to drop most of the way to zero within the next decade. And that's really fast. That would mean new agricultural systems, new manufacturing, ending gasoline and diesel power vehicles, and replacing most of the world's power plants. Here's the wrinkle. <clears throat> to get to zero, everyone would have to stop emitting, not only Americans and Europeans and Chinese, but also Indians and Africans and South Americans. But asking countries that have contributed almost nothing to the problem to now stop development and delay economic growth, all because other countries have produced way, way too much carbon, that's a total non-starter. Getting everyone to zero emissions is geopolitically untenable. And that's a huge problem. Think of the atmosphere like a bathtub. Colbert says, quote, so long as the tap is running, a stoppered tub will continue to fill. Turn the tap down and the tub will still keep filling just more slowly. Massively cutting emissions doesn't mean CO2 levels would drop. They just rise less quickly. The point, cutting emissions is at once absolutely essential and entirely insufficient. Instead, we're going to have to go negative, negative on emissions. That is, we, those of us that can, the nations that can, we have to take out more than everyone puts in. And to do that, we're going to have to go get the carbon with technology. And here's where things get interesting. Because there are actually a lot of cool ideas for grabbing carbon out of the air, trapping it in rock, burying it in the ocean, planting trees. Plans have been made to plant a trillion trees, which could remove something like 200 billion tons of carbon. This many trees would need 3.5 million square miles. Imagine a forest the size of the United States. Obviously, we can't do this alone. Also, uh, we can't just put a forest that big just anywhere, right? If the tundra uh, was converted to forest, for example, it would uh, make an already reflective part of the earth non-reflective. It would absorb energy and thus actually contribute to global warming and kind of defeat the purpose. Likewise, many of the really nifty carbon sequestration, that's grabbing, uh, carbon grabbing technologies, they actually require energy to work. That is. Our solutions to contain CO2 actually create CO2. 
And then there's the price tag. At anything like the necessary scale, current solutions are prohibitively expensive. What we need is time, time for development and research for funding and implementation. And this is where the idea of overshoot comes in. That is, even if we miss our global temp targets, scientists believe that there will still be a well, bumpy sort of grace period during which we should be able to dig our way out. <clears throat> Technology solutions can create and extend this period. Hopefully we won't need it, but if we do, we can buy more time. Time enough to get the carbon, time enough to get to negative emissions, time enough to turn everything around. Imagine being in New Orleans and watching freighters and barges float by overhead. It's a temporary fix. And that's when we start talking about solar geoengineering, where the idea, quite literally, is to dim the sun. Colbert says, quote, geoengineering is out there. It's been described as dangerous beyond belief, a broad highway to hell, unimaginably drastic, and also inevitable. Andy Parker of the Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative has said, quote, we live in a world where deliberately dimming the sun might be less risky than not doing it. Colbert's book actually takes its title from an increasingly popular geoengineering approach, seeding the atmosphere with calcium carbonate, chalk dust. Essentially, scientists would emulate what a volcano does naturally, toss particulates into the atmosphere to shade the earth below. Put up enough and we can theoretically reduce global temperatures. Theoretically, this could give us cover in an overshoot. We, if we need it, right? This could be a way to create time, the time necessary to reduce emissions, the time necessary to go get the carbon. Again, geoengineering is not a fix, it's a grace period. If we are not successful in turning our emissions negative, the tub will just keep filling and warming will continue. To keep pace with that, we'll just need to keep putting more and more dust up into the air. Our blue skies will turn white. But once started, we can't just stop. That would be like a full-scale levee breach. Colbert describes this as, quote, opening a globe-sized oven door. Once built, the levees must be raised. Once dusted, the skies must stay white. But plans like this may buy us a few extra decades to catch up. At this point, you probably don't need me to mention the law of unintended consequences. No one really knows what will happen next. These choices and solutions are things scientists are spending their every waking moment exploring, exploring what might work, how to make things work more effectively, and how to make them work more inexpensively. Again, no one wants white skies, but what I find encouraging here in this story and what I think we can all take encouragement from is that we do have the power to turn our boat around and more that it is very possible that we can make time enough for a turn to happen. The future, the idea that the future will look like the past, however, that's something we're going to have to get over. Climate scientist Dr. Ruth Gates said, quote, I cannot continue to hope that our planet is not going to change radically. It already is changed. She continues, what I am is a futurist. Our project is acknowledging that a future is coming where nature is no longer fully natural. Elizabeth Colbert goes further saying, quote, Rejecting technology solutions as unnatural isn't going to bring nature back. The choice is not between what was and what is, but between what is and what will be, which often enough is nothing. Let me add a few more comments as we turn to the close. That feels a little dark. There are things we know and there are things we don't know yet. I'm going to ask you to imagine 100 years ago, penicillin did not exist. Think about that for a moment. 
modern medicine as we know it simply didn't exist 100 years ago. 75 years ago, traveling to the moon was unimaginable. Today, we're planning a trip to Mars. 50 years ago, computers entirely filled large rooms. The iPhone first announced 14 years ago, and it can do vastly more than any of those room filling computers. And it is so small, we regularly sit on them by accident. Today, there are several billion of these pocket-sized supercomputers all over the world. Now, I'm no Nostradamus and I don't even play one on TV, but whenever I do hear doom-filled forecasting, I like to remember facts like these. And no, I'm not saying we should relax that all of our problems are going to vanish in a bubble of techno magic. But a hundred years from now, I bet there will be descendants of ours looking back and saying, wow, they didn't even have what you who's it's. Can you imagine? How did, they, how did they ever manage? The fact is we can't know what tools we'll have next. We can't know what the future will be. We're all in the same audience right now, waiting for some future Steve Jobs to say one more thing. But I do have hope. The challenge before us, you and I today, is not can we make change, but will we? That is the problem facing us, that is you and I, is not technical, but political. We need to wake up and we also need to wake up our leaders. 100 years, 30 years, even 10 years is too far away for most politicians to consider seriously unless we the people make them do so. We cannot let our politicians do with the planet what they are doing with New Orleans. We must hold them accountable for lifting their eyes past the next election cycle to the future of the human species on this pale blue dot. That is the job right now. We're going to need to do all of the things. Here in Illinois, we must require that our politicians close the Prairie State coal plant, just as leaders all over the world, all over the world must close all of the power plants that use fossil fuels. And we have to do that as quickly as possible. Now, here in the States, whether we call it a Green New Deal or the house is on fire, we also need to have our leaders, force our leaders, require our leaders to create, fund, and enact plans to radically transform engineering, sorry, manufacturing, transportation, and agriculture, both here and abroad. We need them to invest in our international neighbors to help move them towards zero emissions while we move aggressively and wholeheartedly into negative emissions. We need to hold our leaders' feet to the fire to demand plans to create, fund, and enact solutions to go get the carbon. And we need that right now. And we need you and I to make space for the reality that the future will not look like the past. It's going to be hard. And we need to accept that we are past the era where nature is entirely natural. As Colbert books, Colbert's books show, right? That time is over. Our collective next steps will include some hard decisions. There will be risks. And while I hope it doesn't mean it, it may mean a life lived under a white sky, at least for a while. But if so, it will only be so that one day, some future Earth Day, we will see it blue again. But we are up to this. Our collective future is within our power to make happen. We will see the other side of this. We have the time. The tools are coming. Now it's time to get to work. So say we all.